Our loving Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Father, for all the goodness that you give to us. And Father, we would love to have a revelation of the light that shineth from heaven. So Father, as we come to you now, we just pray that you would open our eyes to behold. Father, if there's a veil on our eyes and there's things that are hid to us, I pray that you would take it off so that we can see the glorious light of the gospel shining unto us. That we can see Christ and Christ crucified in this message. And I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so this message is going to be about light from heaven that was rejected. It has to do with the covenant issue. It's a historical, it's a historical presentation. And um, I know our messenger once said that we have nothing to fear for the future, except we shall forget the way that the Lord has led us in the past. And I believe that there's some teachings that have happened in the past that have been rejected for the most part. And a lot of people think that they've accepted them. And I just want to look at part of this message that was rejected for a large part. Now, let's just examine this quote from Ellen White. It's from Testimonies to Ministers 91 and 92. And it says, The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in, all, in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Now here we have a message that's to be given that has to do with faith, and it has to do with faith in the uplifted Savior, faith in what Christ has done for us. Okay, so shortly after Uriah Smith had sent a letter to Ellen White, there was a vision that was given to Ellen White, and this light came from heaven. And here's what it says regarding the light from heaven, the light on the covenants. It says, Night before last, I was shown that evidences in regards to the covenants were clear and convincing. Yourself and others are spending your investigative powers for naught to produce a position on the covenants to vary from the position that Brother Wagner has presented. Had you received the true light which shineth, you would not have imitated or gone over the same manner of interpretation and misconstruing the scriptures as did, as did the Jews. The covenant question is a clear question and will be received by every candid, unprejudiced mind. But I was brought where the Lord gave me an insight into this matter. You have turned from that plain light. And this is the light that was to lighten the earth. This was what she's talking about, the covenant question. One of the messages about faith is to recognize the covenant issue. And the covenant issue is to believe the promises of God. And that's what we're going to examine here. And how Ellen White said that this covenant issue had to do with the light that was from heaven. She said, Now I tell you here before God that the covenant question as it has been presented is the truth. And that was in regards to Ellet Wagner. Ellet J. Wagner. Now there are two schools of thoughts that were happening around the time of 1888. One of them had to do with uh, the covenant beginning at the Old Covenant beginning at creation and the New Covenant beginning at the cross. And we're going to look at some of these thoughts and we're going to compare these two views to see where the light was lying and especially with regards to the prophet. Now this is D.M. Can right here and his view on the covenant was he said that the New Covenant or the Gospel then began to be preached by Jesus Christ. The mediator of the New Covenant had now come to supersede the Old Covenant but Jesus was careful to have the new covenant offered only to the Jews because the Lord had promised that this new covenant was to be made with the house of Israel. Now here he says that the covenant was only made after Jesus Christ. It was only began to be preached at the time of Jesus Christ. So I have drawn a little diagram here so everybody can see. And we have the central piece here, which is the cross. 
And what he's saying here is that the new covenant began to be preached here. Now we're going to look at what Elliot Wagner preached. And uh, we're going to compare the two. Let's first look at another quote from Brother Uriah Smith. And here's what Uriah Smith said. He said very similar to what D.M. Canwright said. He said, The conclusion is therefore clear that these two covenants embody two grand divisions of the work which heaven has undertaken for human redemption and cover two special dispensations devoted to the development of this work. And again, he says, one dispensation, one covenant here. One dispensation, one covenant here. Saying that the covenants are dispensational and they only apply to certain periods of time. The old covenant was before the cross, is what he's saying. The new covenant only applies to those after the cross. Now, here's what Ellen White said in Patriarchs and Prophets. And I'll just, uh, I'll just give a brief quote. We're going to look at a little bit more of what she has to say on this issue. But she says that the covenant of grace was first made with man in Eden. And that goes right back to Adam. That goes a little further than the cross. And so I have the cross here as the central piece, and I have the light shining back both ways. And that's what I've done here with this diagram to show that the cross is what ratified this covenant, but it did not begin at that point. It began back at man in Eden. And we're going to look at this a little bit more as we continue. Now here's what Elliot J. Wagner said. But as surely as Christ was slain from the foundation of the world, he was raised from the dead from the foundation of the world, for he saves men by his life. Therefore, the Christian dispensation began for man as soon at least as the fall. There are indeed two dispensations, a dispensation of sin and death and a dispensation of righteousness and life. But these two dispensations have ran parallel from the fall. God deals with men as individuals and not as nations, nor according to the century in which they live. No matter what the period of the world's history, a man can at any time pass from the old dispensation into the new. It is when men know Christ after the Spirit that old things are passed away and all things become new. But Moses endured as seeing him who was invisible, and therefore Moses was in the new dispensation. And so here we have two covenants that run parallel from the beginning of the world. The old covenant or old dispensation and the new dispensation. Both of them have access to the very life of Christ from the foundation of the world, the life that endured the cross. The only way that a man can ever overcome sin is by that life. And without that life, giving the power all the way back to here, a man could never have victory in his life. He, could ne he had to have faith in Christ and Christ crucified. And that's the central point of this message. Now, let's look at the scriptures a little bit. We'll go to Deuteronomy 5, verse 2 and 3. And I just want us to notice in the scriptures that these two covenants are actually in the scriptures. One covenant was actually made with Abraham, and we're going to look at the Abrahamic covenant in a second. But I want us to notice something that God did on Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy 5, verse 2 and 3. Now it says, The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. That's at Mount Sinai, and that's right here. He made a covenant with us in Horeb, the Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us alive this day. Now you notice in verse 3 it says, The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers. So therefore, there's two covenants here. There's the covenant with the fathers, which is the covenant with Abraham, and the covenant that they made at Mount Sinai. There are two covenants, and both of them are here. Now I want to notice that one is the old covenant, the one at Mount Sinai, and the one is the new covenant, the one with Abraham. Both of these are running parallel from the fall. Now let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians three sixteen and 17. Just to get an overview, we'll just do a quick overview on these two covenants from the scriptures. <clears throat> Galatians three sixteen and 17. It says, regarding this covenant, actually I'll read verse 15 as well. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet it be confirmed. No man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now he's talking about a covenant here. And he says, regarding this covenant, he says in verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not in the seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So this covenant that was made with Abraham 
has to do with the blood of Christ. And regarding this covenant, verse 17, it says, This I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, that's the covenant with Abraham, the law, which is 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So the law was given 430 years after the covenant was made with Abraham. The law given at Mount Sinai, or the covenant made at Mount Sinai, cannot change this covenant here. This covenant here continues on. And this is the everlasting covenant that was confirmed by the blood of Christ. The old covenant was confirmed by the blood of a bull and a goat. And it, it didn't last very long, as we're going to see. Now, there was something that, there was a covenant made at Mount Sinai. I'd just like to briefly look at these two covenants again. One covenant is based on better promises. That's a covenant that was made with Abraham. And there's another covenant that had problems or fault with the promises. Fault was found with the promises. Now, it says in Hebrews 8, 6 to 8, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also is he the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises? For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Now, here we have a problem. One covenant has better promises, so obviously the other covenant doesn't have as good of promises. It has worse promises, I would say. And it, and it says there's a fault found with the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai. So the, not, the other covenant had to be established afterwards. Now here's what it says. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now where was the fault found? Was the fault found in the promises of God? God's promises don't have fault, do they? But there was a fault found. And that first covenant had a fault. The fault was in the people because the people made their own promise. The other covenant is based on the promises of God. And the promises of God are not faulty. They're perfect. Exodus 19, verse 6 to 8. Let's go to Exodus 19. And look at these promises that were made. Now here's what God says. He says, God gives them a lot of promises here. He says, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So God gives them all these promises. He says he will hold them. He will keep them. He will bear them on eagles' wings and bring them to himself, it says in verse 4. And God makes a lot of promises And verse 7 says, Moses came and called for the elders of the people, laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. And then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Here it is. Here's the problem with this covenant. There was fault found in their promises. Within three weeks they had broken the covenant. And we're going to look at this from the spirit of prophecy in a few minutes. But... The two covenants go way back. They don't just stop at Mount Sinai. They actually go right to the foundation of the world. And we can even go and look at Abraham, and that covenant was there in Abraham's time. Though it wasn't made with Israel and Judah, that old covenant, it was still there. It was made with Hagar. It says here, Tell me ye that desire to be under the law. Do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. So there's Hagar and Sarah. But he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai. So here it's saying that Hagar is a symbol of Mount Sinai, and it genders to bondage. And it says... For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of the promise. But as he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. And we, like Abraham, or sorry, like Isaac, are children of the new covenant. 
And this new covenant, any study of the two covenants, E.J. Wagner once said, any study of the two covenants without bringing these two people into it, Isaac and Ishmael, is an incomplete study of the covenants. And I'm going to get to what, what this means, because this means that this covenant was available before Mount Sinai, and any person at any time could enter into a covenant like this. Now, what was the problem with Hagar was that instead of saying, we accept the promise of God, it was all that the Lord has said, we will do. We're going to fulfill the promise of God through our works. We're going to do it of ourselves. And that's what they said at Mount Sinai, was they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. They tried to turn this covenant into a covenant of works. When God's covenant is a covenant of promise, and God said all that the Lord has said, I will do. The Lord will do it through us. Now, <clears throat> this, is, this was a letter from Uriah Smith to Ellen White on February 17th, 1890. And I'd like you guys to pay careful attention to these dates because these dates have particular significance. She was given a vision shortly after this date, right after she sent the letter, right after this letter was sent to her. So this letter sent by Smith to Ellen White. It says, as it looks to me, next to the death of Brother James White, the greatest calamity that ever befell our cause was when Dr. Wagner put his articles on the book of Galatians through the signs. I suppose the question of the law in Galatians was settled way back in 1856. I was surprised at the articles because they seemed to me then and still seem to me to contradict so directly what you wrote to J.H. Wagner. So, he had a problem with the law in Galatians and the articles that were pre being presented in, in J.H. Wagner's writings. And, and here's what he says a little bit more. He says, The position on Galatians, which I deem is erroneous, he, that is Wagner, took his position on Galatians the same which you had condemned in his father, J.H. Wagner. So the problem is his position in the law, with the law of Galatians. And here's what, here's, what, uh, here's what she wrote back. She said, On March 8th, 1890, only a few weeks later, she said, as to the law in Galatians, I have no burden and never have. So regarding responding to the problem with J.H. Wagner, she said, it wasn't with the law. That was not my burden. She said, I'm asked concerning the law in Galatians, what law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? I answer both, the ceremonial and the moral code of Ten Commandments. That's the, that's the schoolmaster in Galatians chapter 3. Now, <clears throat> here's what J.H. Wagner did have a problem with, and he was different than his son on this issue. And it says, We know that the New Testament or covenant dates from the death of the testator, the very point where the first covenant ceased. Now, what he's saying here is that the new covenant began in 31 AD and goes after that, whereas E.J. Wagner was saying that the new covenant was from the foundation of the world. And you can see a difference here between the two men. And that is a big point, and we'll get to that. Because that's what Wagner says. He says, the Christian dispensation began for man as soon at least as the fall. There are indeed two dispensations, a dispensation of sin and death, a dispensation of righteousness and life. But these two dispensations have run parallel from the fall. And so he's saying that a man can at any time pass from those from the old to the new dispensation. Here's another quote here. And this is from Ellen White. And again, I'd just like you to note the date, March 10th. It's just a couple days after she had wrote to Uriah Smith. And she says, I am much pleased to learn that Professor Prescott is giving the same lessons in his class to the students that Brother Wagner has been giving. He is presenting the covenants. Since I made the statement last Sabbath that the view of the covenants as it had been taught by Brother Wagner was truth, it seems that great relief has come to many minds. So here we have Ellen White saying that the view on the covenants that Wagner was teaching is the truth. And that's given to Willie White, and we see that some of the brethren are starting to teach it now. She was given a vision, and uh, here's the vision I wanted to show. And uh, here's what she says, The light that came to me night before last laid it all open again before me, just the influence that was at work and just where it would lead. You are going over the very same ground that they went over in the days of Christ. You have had their experience, but God deliver us. You have stood right in the way of God. 
The earth is to be lighted with his glory. And if you stand where you stand today, you might just as quick say that the spirit of God was the spirit of the devil. Do not hang on to Brother Smith. In the name of God, I tell you, he is not in the light. He has not been in the light since he was at Minneapolis. Let the truth of God come into your hearts. Open the door. Now I tell you before God that the covenant question as it has been presented is the truth. Now she had light given to her on this particular subject and she calls it the light that is to lighten the earth. She says it's the light of God. He is not in the light and he's missing the light. So there's a particular issue that she's saying is the light from God and that's the issue regarding the covenant question that Wagner is presenting. Now here's what she says about that covenant in Patriarchs and Prophets, August, and this was just shortly after the issue was coming out, August 26, 1890. And she says, regarding the covenant of grace, she says, the covenant of grace was first made with man in Eden. This same covenant was renewed to Abraham. The promise pointed to Christ. So it was given right there and right there, and it pointed to Christ. So Abraham understood it. See Galatians 3, 8, and 16. And he trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It was this faith that was accounted unto him for righteousness. The covenant with Abraham also maintained the authority of God's law. And that's what we have today. We have the covenant that was made with Abraham. This is the only covenant by which you can have life because it points to Christ. Whereas the other covenant doesn't have that. Let's look at the old covenant. And why would, a, why would we need another covenant? What was the point? What was the point of the old covenant? Was it because God, God's promises in the new covenant or the everlasting covenant weren't good? Now it says, Another compact called in scripture, the old covenant, was formed between God and Israel at Sinai and was then ratified by the blood of a sacrifice. The Abrahamic covenant was ratified by the blood of Christ. So you see how they're ratified here? One's ratified by this sacrifice. One's ratified by the blood of a bull or a goat. And it's not a blood of a sacrifice, as she says here. And it's not the blood of Christ. So only one covenant is good. Only one covenant can give life. And that's the everlasting covenant. It says, but if the Abrahamic covenant contained the promise of redemption, why then was another covenant formed at Sinai? And it says, in their bondage, the people had, to a great extent, lost the knowledge of God and of the principles of the Abrahamic covenant. In delivering them from Egypt, God sought to reveal to them his power and his mercy, that they might led to, be led to love and to trust him. He brought them down to the Red Sea, where, pursued by the Egyptians, escape seemed impossible, that they might realize their utter helplessness, their need of divine aid. And then he wrought deliverance for them. Thus they were filled with love and gratitude to God and with confidence in his power to help them. He had bound them to himself as their deliverer from temporal bondage. So the old covenant is a symbol of, hey, let's do it by our own power. And this covenant is to teach them about his power. Now here's what it says. It says at the end, living in the midst of idolatry and corruption, they had no true conception of the holiness of God, of the exceeding sinfulness of their own hearts, their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God's law and their need of a savior. All this they must be taught. So this is what the old covenant was given for. That was what the symbols were. The symbols could never cleanse the conscience of sin. But the blood of Christ can. And that blood of Christ had to have power back then to be able to do it. They had to see past those symbols. Now, Here's what God wanted to give them at Mount Sinai. Exodus 6, verse 2 to 8. And it says, God spake unto Moses, said unto him, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. So this is the covenant he wants to give them, the covenant with the fathers. By the name of God Almighty, but my name Jehovah, was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant, 
Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you in unto the land concerning which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for an heritage. Or I will be your people. I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And he promised it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when will they receive that land? It's at the second coming, because they're all, they're all in the grave at this point, right? So it's pointing to the second coming as saying, this is the land that I promised to you. It's pointing to the promise to come. Exodus 24, 7, it says, uh, here's the problem again, in Patriarchs and Prophets also, 371, 372, and here's what she said regarding their promise, that promise that he found fault in. It says, God brought them to Sinai. He manifested his glory. He gave them his law with the promise of great blessing on condition of obedience. So he's giving him, them the promise. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The people did not realize the sinfulness of their own hearts and that without Christ, it was impossible for them to keep God's law and they readily entered into covenant with God. Feeling that they were able to establish their own righteousness, they declared all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Exodus 24, 7. So here we have the problem. The problem is in the promise. And the promise is that they thought that they could establish their own righteousness by saying all that the Lord has said we will do. When the new covenant is based on better promises, which is the promise of God to instill in our hearts righteousness and not for us to try of our own selves. The Bible says it is by grace through faith and not of yourselves lest you should boast. And that's not something that just began in 31 AD. Now here's what it says here in Patriarchs and Prophets 371, 372 regarding what, what happened with the new covenant. How long did it last? Or the old covenant. How long did the covenant at Sinai last? She says it only lasted a few weeks. It says only a few weeks passed before they broke their covenant with God and bowed down to worship a graven image. They could not hope for the favor of God through a covenant which they had broken can't get can't get you can't have salvation through that covenant it's impossible and now seeing their sinfulness and their need of pardon they were brought to feel their need of the savior revealed in the abrahamic covenant and shadowed forth in the sacrificial offerings now by faith and love they were bound to god as their deliverer from the bondage of sin now they were prepared to appreciate the blessings of the new covenant did they have to wait for 31 AD to appreciate the blessings of the new covenant the terms of the old covenant were obey and live. The new covenant was established on better promises, the promise of forgiveness of sins and the grace of God to renew the heart, bring it into harmony with the principles of God's law. And the only way that could happen is by Christ and Christ crucified. They had to see it from the foundation of the world. And therefore, back here, this covenant did not last all the way to the cross. It was a covenant that's always been there for every man who's ever tried to establish their own works. This covenant here has always been here as well. And it was given at Mount Sinai for them. That was what God wanted to give them. He gave them better promises at Mount Sinai. Now here's what happened because they didn't accept it. And here's what Ellen White says. Is she says, here's a brother who spoke and, and it just reveals the heart and what happened. And I think we're going through something similar today and... God is calling us to repentance. Brother Dan Jones then spoke. He stated that he had been tempted to give up the testimonies. And I think that's something that I've seen has been happening today. It says, but if he did this, he knew he should yield everything. For we had regarded the testimonies as interwoven with the third angel's message. And he spoke of terrible scenes of temptations. I really pitied the man. And... I think that a lot of things are happening right now that people are questioning the testimonies because the testimonies support this message that was given by E.J. Wagner and the covenants. And God is calling us to repentance. And here's, here's some of the things that they were saying. It says, 
Now here's what Ellen White says. She says, the law in Galatians was their only plea. Why, I asked, is your interpretation of the law in Galatians more dear to you and you more zealous to maintain your ideas on this point than to acknowledge the workings of the Spirit of God? You've been weighing every precious heaven-sent testimony by your own scales as you interpreted the law in Galatians. Nothing could come to you in regard to the truth and the power of God unless it should bear your imprint. The precious ideas you had idolized on the law of Galatians. These testimonies of the Spirit of God, the fruits of the Spirit of God, have no weight unless they are stamped with your ideas of the law in Galatians. I am afraid of you and I'm afraid of your interpretation of any scripture which has revealed itself in such an unchristlike spirit as you have manifested and has cost me so much unnecessary labor. If you are such a very cautious man and so very critical, lest you shall receive something not in accordance with the scriptures, I want your minds to look on these things in the true light. Let your caution be exercised in the line of fear, lest you are commu committing the sin against the Holy Ghost. Have your critical minds taken view of this subject? I say, if your views on Long Galatians and the fruits are of the character I have seen in Minneapolis and ever since up to this time, my prayer is that I may be as far from your understanding and interpretation of the scriptures as it is possible for me to be. I'm afraid of any application of scripture that needs such a spirit and bears such fruit as you have manifested. One thing is certain, I shall never come into harmony with such a spirit as long as God gives me my reason. Now, brethren, I have nothing to say, no burden in regard to the law in Galatians. This matter looks to me of minor consequence in comparison with the spirit you have brought into your faith. It is exactly of the same peace that was manifested by the Jews in reference to the work and mission of Jesus Christ. The most convincing testimony that we can bear to others that we have the truth is the spirit which attends the advocacy of that truth. If it sanctifies the heart of the receiver, if it makes him gentle, kind, forbearing, true, and Christ-like, then he will give some evidence of the fact that he has the genuine truth. But if he acts as did the Jews when their opinions and ideas were crossed, then we certainly cannot receive such testimony, for it does not produce the fruits of righteousness. Their own interpretations of Scripture were not correct, yet the Jews would receive no evidence from the revelation of the Spirit of God, but would, when their ideas were contradicted, even murder the Son of God. And some of the things she says about Jones and Wagner, she says that they were like Caleb and Joshua. They brought a message. And the men, instead of accepting it, the message was, we can go up and take the land by faith. We just have to believe the word of God. We can accept the promises of God. And that's what the new covenant is all about. It's about believing the promises of God and accepting, going up into the land, taking the land by faith. And that's what these men came to bring. And... I believe that if we fail to understand that this points back here, that it puts doubt on the promises. It says in the Bible, when God made promise to Abraham, he could swear by no greater. And it was from a God who cannot lie. So therefore, we can trust the promise of God just as Abraham could. Abraham did not have to check himself. He did not have to doubt the promises of God. Abraham believed the promise of God. When God said, I'm going to give my son for you, he accepted it. When God said, I'm going to fulfill the promise through Sarah, he accepted it. When he didn't accept it, that was when he fell. And so here we have, he learned trust in the promises of God. Those are the two covenants. Now, the Spirit of Christ is rejected, and I believe that that is what happened in 1888. The Spirit of Christ brought a most precious message. And it is the spirit that is going to change the hearts of the people. Now, here's what it says. E.G. White, she says this on March 8, 1890. And uh, that's to Uriah Smith. She says, by failing to cherish the spirit of Christ, by taking wrong positions in the controversy over the law in Galatians, a question that many have not fully understood before taking a wrong position, the church has sustained a sad loss. She's talking about some of these men that are going the wrong way. She also said, I am forced... By the attitude of my brethren, by the attitude my brethren have taken in the spirit evidence to say, God deliver me from your ideas of the law in Galatians. And also one last quote. 
The Lord's work needed every jot and tittle of experience that he had given Elder Butler and Elder Smith, but they have taken their own course in some things irrespective of the light God has given. And that's a letter to Stephen Haskell. And so the brethren are being called to this light, and this light is the light of the 1888 message, and this is the covenant message. And if we, fail, if we misunderstand all the light that's been given and we misunderstand what was given before the cross, that these covenants don't just begin at Mount Sinai or they don't just begin with Abraham or they don't just begin at the cross. And we understand that these covenants go from creation, both of them parallel to each other. And we understand that the power of this cross is the power of the everlasting covenant, the blood of the everlasting covenant. We can be saved from our sins. We, we need to accept this by faith. This is what God is calling us to. And uh, that's all I want to say. Let's have a prayer. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Father, for the precious light that you've given to us, the message that comes from heaven. Father, we thank you for the messengers that you've sent to us, and I pray, Father, that we, we can recognize the great and precious light that comes so that in our beings, that we can say with every fiber of our being, Amen. Amen. That we can trust that the word is truth and that we can believe your promises. And Father, I know that we've all tried to make an old covenant. We've all tried to say all that the Lord has said we will do. But Father, we want to recognize your precious promises that you will do in us above all that we ask or think, that you will work mightily in each one of us. And Father, I pray that each one of us can see that there is much light that we have, we have been suppressing. And Father, that we can bring this light out into, the, out into the, the open and that people can behold the glorious light of the gospel, that it can shine in their hearts, that the veil can be removed. And we just pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.